I am absolutely delighted to, to welcome Mark Lemley. Uh, we tried really hard to, to get him uh, to, to be at a conference last year. Uh, so I'm very happy that we managed to, 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 to get you on for, for this year. Um, I think if I was to read your bio, we will spend the 30 read, minutes that we have. Read, read. <laughs> so let me just let me just tell you that if you are interested and want to be amazed, go on the event page and you can click on on his on his last name and and see his bio. Uh, I will just give you one one fact. Uh, Mark is the most cited scholar in IP and one of the ten most cited legal scholars of all time. So on that good note, uh, Mark, thank you so very much for being with us. Um, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, uh, so thank you. This is, um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And, um, uh, and I'm happy that uh, uh, this conference is going on. And I'm even happier that the project as a whole is going on, uh, because I think it's really important. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, uh, something that um, uh, you uh, might or might not decide fits squarely within computational antitrust, but I think it does. And, and uh, we can talk about why at the end. Uh, and this is new work. Um, uh, with several colleagues of mine at Stanford in the medical school uh, on the problem of interlocking directorates. Uh, now, uh, a little background on the problem of interlocking directorates. Um, uh, when we passed the Sherman Act in uh, 1890 uh, to ban cartels and monopolies, uh, companies quickly started looking for ways around those uh, strictures. And one of the ways they found was uh, to uh, uh, sort of create cozy arrangements in which nominal competitors actually shared uh, board members. Uh, and the result was that you would communicate information more easily. You could have a, um, uh, you could facilitate a cartel, uh, uh, but also uh, uh, having board members across different companies meant that uh, the board didn't have an incentive to compete as effectively, uh, as aggressively in, um, uh, as it would if it weren't going to destroy uh, its own company's position. So when we passed the Clayton Act in 1914, um, uh, we passed a specific uh, provision uh, that banned the use of interlocking directorates. Uh, you could not have a member of a board of directors who was also serving uh, as, uh, uh, as an officer or director of a company that had even a little bit of competitive overlap. Uh, there's a minimum threshold of revenue for the company uh, that's now indexed for inflation, but it's pretty minimal. It's something like $5 million dollars. Um, uh, and there's a minimal threshold of, of overlap and competition, but it's also pretty small. It's, it's uh, one or two percent. Um, courts applying this doctrine uh, have uniformly held that interlocking directorates are illegal per se. That the only thing you have to demonstrate to show that they are illegal uh, is that there is a board member who's on two companies that compete and that meet these revenue thresholds. Uh, but those cases are fairly old. Uh, those cases are fairly old because there's been, uh, in recent decades, virtually no enforcement of this provision, at least until this year, uh, when the agencies have started to pay attention to the problem. Uh, and the paper you're about to hear me talk about is, I hope, one of the reasons the agencies have started to pay attention to the problem. Uh, so um, what we have is a, is a, a database that sort of uh, tries to figure out for one particular industry, the life sciences industry, all right, how big uh, uh, an overlap problem there is. Uh, so we've got a, a connectome uh, that sort of shows the relationships and connections between over 2,000 publicly traded life science company boards. Uh, and then we'll drill down into some more specific market structures uh, in, in a moment. Uh, here's the result of the connections between board members. It's a little hard to see the lines here. Each dot is a, 
uh, is a board member, and each line, and there are a lot of lines, uh, is a uh, is a sort of connected or interlocked board member. That is a board member who's also serving on the board of another life science company. Um, and as we get towards the center, uh, we see companies with multiple interlocks, multiple board members uh, uh, who are also serving on uh, at least the uh, uh, the boards of other companies in similar fields, and we'll talk a little bit about whether they're competitors and how we know in a minute. Um, I, I, just a kind of background note on, on how this came about. Uh, uh, Ishan Kumar and my colleagues at the uh, at the medical school had put this kind of remar remarkable thing together. I think as a as a kind of business matter to show what. Um, uh, uh, show kind of how much overlap and intersection there was, and they came to me to show it to me, and I said, that's really interesting. It's also illegal, um, right, that, that you can't do this, but it seems pretty clear that people don't know you can't do it. Uh, the interlocks have increased dramatically in the last two decades. Here we break them down by year, uh, and so you see kind of occasional interlocks between a few companies in 2000. You start to see more and more clustering uh, over time, um, a slight uh, drop back in 2009 and 2010 with the recession. But uh, once again, um, uh, the, uh, by 2019, we see really quite a lot of dramatic overlap uh, in the life sciences field between board members. Uh, and that's uh, true to such an extent that uh, close to 20% of all firms uh, in the life sciences industry have interlocking directors uh, by the year 2020. Uh, the number of interlocking directors they have also goes up, right? So the average number of interlocking directors uh, is uh, more than 1.5 at this point. So it's not just that we see some companies doing it. We see some companies doing it a lot. There are a lot of uh, uh, people interlocked across multiple boards uh, in the uh, in the in the space. Um, uh, some of these change over time, of course. People grow, uh, people join boards, people leave boards, uh, and so one of the things we show here is uh, right that the both the new connections and the cut connections uh, are increasing. The total number of changes are increasing. That said, as we show in the in the paper, um, uh, interlocked board members actually have a longer tenure than non-interlocked board members. They tend to stay longer on boards. Uh, when they are, in fact, sitting in multiple uh, uh, potentially conflicting roles. So uh, how do we break this down? How do we decide whether they're competitors? Well, the first thing we did was we, we sort of broke it into disease category uh, uh, using SIC codes and other uh, analyses. And one of the things you can see here is that there are very significant differences between the number of interlocks by uh, uh, by industry, uh, you know, those companies making dental products, not such a big overlap problem, oncology, uh, immunology, neurology, infectious disease, uh, by contrast, a large number of interlocks uh, between board members. Um, uh, and, uh, and we think that's indicative, right, that this is a kind of, in, there, there are individual kind of markets uh, and industries where this is more of a problem. But you might say, well, wait a minute, um, you know, there are different immunology uh, drugs, and maybe they don't all compete with each other, right? Uh, so there's some possibility that you could say, well, I'm doing uh, one form of immunology, and I'm also sitting on a board of another company, but it does a completely different form of immunology. We're in the same general market space, but we're not actually competitors in the sense that antitrust law would worry about. So to drill down on that, we actually drilled to a more specific uh, number, right? And this measured uh, NDA clinical trial indications. These are companies that are filing for NDAs for drugs to treat precisely the same uh, disease. Uh, they are much more likely to be competitors. And even there, we see, right, a remarkable number of interlocks. So the whole graph here shows um, uh, all of the interlocks. Uh, we then highlight and break out the uh, the ones, the, the industries where there are more than 25 uh, interlocked boards 
uh, in a particular NDA application space. And you'll note that in some, like non-small cell lung cancer, there are more than 150 interlock boards just in this particular disease uh, uh, treatment indication. Uh, and what this suggests to us is that this is a real and quite significant phenomenon, even as you drill down and narrow down on, uh, uh, on companies that are much more likely to be competitive. Um, we also run this number by revenue. Uh, now, I, you'll recall that I mentioned there's a sort of small uh, but non-zero revenue threshold. Um, and a lot of the interlocks are, in fact, kind of pre-revenue companies. Uh, we can talk at the, at the end of this about whether we think that ought to be viewed as a problem. It is not currently illegal per se for two companies, uh, each of which are pre-revenue, to have overlapping or interlocking board members. Although in the life sciences space, one might reasonably think that we should be just as worried about this problem uh, for pre-revenue companies because they're the ones filing the NDAs, they're the ones who are aiming uh, to potentially compete in this space. But in any event, you see plenty of folks above the 5 million threshold, so that would basically be uh, anything from uh, from this row and this column on, all of these are interlocks that are captured within uh, the existing framework of, of the law. All of these interlocks are at least presumptively illegal uh, because these companies are competing with each other. Furthermore, we find that the interlocks are actually more common among high revenue rather than low revenue companies. So we, we break the analysis into companies with less than $5 million of revenue who are not currently subject to current law. Uh, and you find that the high revenue companies, uh, there are both a larger number of them and it, and it is more, uh, it is increasing the number of overlaps uh, among the companies who are subject to the current revenue thresholds. We also show that many companies, a surprising number of companies, have more than one interlocking director. So it's not just you have a board member who also happens to sit on a competitor. Uh, in many cases, uh, in hundreds of cases, we see uh, uh, two or more high revenue, uh, two or more directors on high revenue companies uh, that are interlocked with other competitors. Uh, so there are multiple and overlapping interlocks, as the original connectome graph showed. Um, the percentage of all high revenue firms that are interlocking, which is the number here on the right, uh, has, uh, has increased to more than 50% of all high revenue firms have interlocking boards of directors. Uh, uh, hundreds of these companies are doing this thing, which the law says is illegal. Uh, and finally, as a kind of robustness check, we actually ran uh, uh, kind of the, the kind of not narrowest, toughest test we could think of, uh, right? We, so these are this is a report of the number of companies, publicly traded companies, who have a member of a board of directors who also serves on the board of a company that the company identifies in its 10K as its primary competitor. Right? That is, in each of these numbers every year, we've got three companies who write a 10K that says our primary competitive threat is company X, and we also turn out to share a board member uh, with that company X. Uh, now, um, this, we think, is a problem. Uh, so uh, we think there's a lot to be done here to think about um, uh, sort of why it's a problem, what we might do about it. Uh, but then we want to start with the question of sort of like what explains it. Right. Um, uh, maybe the answer, I think a significant possible answer is uh, is financing. I think a certain number of these interlocks come from private equity uh, uh, folks who are funding companies in the field and put a member on the board. Um, I will note, though, that right, our data is limited to public firms in the life sciences industry. There is reason to suspect that the problem is actually a lot larger once you go beyond public firms to private firms, because the venture capital market uh, may be even more likely to be putting members on the board. Uh, I also think that it's worth uh, investigating, and one of the things we hope to investigate in subsequent work is um, 
whether even if it's not the same person on the board, uh, a private equity company or a venture capital company has uh, members on multiple different boards uh, who then in turn share a fiduciary duty to their uh, to their VC or private equity firm. So the problem may be significantly understated uh, because we may see people who aren't the same actual individual, but who are still reporting back to the same VC or the same uh, uh, private equity firm uh, and are still Still, therefore, potentially coordinating um, uh, coordinating uh, their their behavior. Another thing we'd like to know is whether it extends to all sectors of the economy. We happen in the life sciences to have pretty good measures at a statistical level of whether companies actually compete with each other. But one of the things we are hoping to do is to try to get. Um, uh, data that reaches out into other industry sectors where we have similar measures that are uh, that are narrower and more precise than simply SIC code. Uh, so one of the things we would love to do, for instance, is to gather uh, HHI work that has already been done in previous antitrust suits, which sets out the list of competitors that might allow us to uh, uh, to reach out into other sectors of the economy. But I'll note that there's no reason to think that this is only a life sciences problem, right? Uh, and that in fact, uh, to the contrary, we suspect that there's a problem that is broader across the entire economy. Um, uh, this may offer a mechanism to explain the common ownership literature. So there's a big running debate in antitrust in the last five years. Uh, Einar Alauke demonstrates that um, companies that are commonly owned uh, are, tend to compete less effectively, right, than companies that aren't, where that is where they have overlapping shareholders. A uh, number of people have pushed back saying, come on, what's the mechanism, right? We see the data, we see the statistical result, but tell us how that would work. Interlocking directorates or overlapped directorates by financing companies may actually uh, provide an explanation for how this should work. So um, policy implications. Um, I, the, one, the, you know, the big policy implication here is huge numbers of publicly, publicly traded companies are breaking the law and have been for years, right? That seems problematic and significant to note in and of itself. It's not clear to me whether they just don't worry about the law because it hasn't been enforced in a while or whether they're simply unaware of it. My guess is that they're simply unaware of it, right? That uh, companies have gotten out of the business of consulting with antitrust lawyers on things they do, uh, and they just hire a director who they decide is the person they want on the director or who they're financing uh, uh, folks tell them to hire or who is the sort of leading academic expert in the field, and they don't actually look uh, to see whether this is a problem probably because it doesn't occur to anybody in the corporate suite uh, that this is potentially something that's illegal. Um, now, I think it's a reasonable question, uh, uh, sort of whether right, it ought to be illegal. One thing to note here, another potential explanation that is sometimes offered is, well, there's a shortage of the right people, right? We, you know, why do we have overlaps? We have overlaps because there's only a few experts in this new scientific field of endeavor and everybody wants them. Um, uh, you know, I think that is, uh, uh, Bobby Lawson asks in the chat, right, uh, is this a result of economic inequality? I think there's something to that, right? Uh, and and I, might, I might turn that around a little bit. Um, uh, there's been a big push uh, in the DEI movement, right, uh, and ESG to try to diversify boards of directors of publicly traded companies. Uh, one way to sort of increase that diversity might actually be to tell a bunch of companies who right now are using uh, the same overlapping board members, almost always white men, uh, that no, you've actually got to go out and find a different director, right? So we may actually be reaching, forcing people to reach further might actually increase the goal of diversity there. A broader question, though, is right whether antitrust law should care as much about this as it does. Uh, we don't treat that many things as illegal per se. I do find board interlocks problematic. I do think they provide a mechanism to facilitate a cartel. They provide a reason, even if it's not deliberate, why a board member might not uh, want to encourage the company to aggressively target a competitor uh, because they'd be hurting their own self-interest and their own uh, fiduciary interest in the competitor. 
Um, but it'd be worth trying to figure out, right, how often uh, this actually plays out in practice, right? Do we actually see cartels more often with interlocked boards? Do we see less vigorous competition with interlocked boards? And one of the things that we hope to do in future work is to, is to look for metrics to try to figure that out. If that's not true, then we might want to rethink the per se rule, uh, right? And there may be circumstances in which uh, only a few people are, in fact, the right people to be on the board. Um, uh, uh, and that overlap might benefit the companies. But assuming we don't change the law, um, I think one of the things that that comes out of this paper is we need better enforcement. Right now, maybe the fact that the DOJ and the FTC are starting to take note of this, um, uh, starting to contact companies, starting to actually sort of force board board members to leave the board, uh, will bring it to the attention of other companies, and we'll see voluntary compliance. Uh, but it's worth noting that there are virtually no penalties for this um, uh, beyond the removal of the directors itself. That's something that might change. Uh, maybe it should change. Maybe we want to discourage people to um, uh, to um, uh, from from doing this uh, by imposing some penalty on them by having a private right of action. Uh, but here and where I, here's where I get I think we get to the sort of uh, computational antitrust piece. Uh, I my, my view of computational antitrust is broad enough that I think kind of big data analysis to look at market structure ought to fit within the version of computational antitrust we're thinking about. But even if you've got a narrower version in which we're trying to sort of automate uh, a part of this, uh, I think this is ripe for computational antitrust uh, because one of the most obvious solutions to this is a reporting requirement. Um, and I think this is something that could easily be automated, right? Uh, part of if, if part of the problem is people just don't know this is illegal and antitrust agencies don't know it's happening, uh, a simple kind of automated reporting requirement that allows you to check, uh, right, uh, for, for this list of competitors, can I hire this person on the board or is there going to be a problem, uh, could easily... Uh, both increase enforcement uh, and compliance with the law, uh, and make life um, uh, and make make life easier uh, for uh, for the directors and for the companies who aren't going to sort of have their life shaken up when they discover that this is true. So with that, I'll stop. I've got a few minutes left, and I am happy to entertain questions. Wow! Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you already answered quite a few questions we had in the chat. Um, I have some questions for you, and I see more questions coming in our way, so please feel free to use the Q&A function. I will start with quick questions. The first, do you know how they obtained the data, right? So I presume the data came from your colleague at the, the School of Medicine, right? Do you have any idea how they grasp the data? Yeah, so these are publicly traded companies, right? And so they disclose their members of their boards of directors in their public filings, and so we actually just scraped all of those filings every year for uh, for 20 years for all of the companies in the uh, the 2200 companies in the life sciences area. All right. And um, then built, built that sort of network connectome using uh, using sort of uh, software tools to try to uh, that showed the kind of uh, overlaps. There's a there's obviously a kind of name uh, disambiguation issue, right? Is this John Smith the same as that John Smith? And there turned out to be records we can use to to sort of yeah. track that down as well. Um, yeah, uh, we discussed yesterday tools you can use to create those sorts of visualizations. And I believe the code and actually all the data will be put available on the Codex GitHub. And I will put the link in the chat for everyone. Uh, another question, uh, do, do can you- I, can, I, can I flag, there, there are two questions in the Q&A that I think are go to the same question, which is what's the definition of high revenue firms, right? How do you account for the, yep. the net worth uh, uh, limits, right? So uh, the statute has a kind of, a uh, company firm firm must have some combination of uh, revenue, net worth, et cetera, that's above a certain threshold, and they have to have revenue in the market that's above another threshold. That threshold is indexed uh, um, every year. So right now it's about forty million dollars in kind of total value of the company uh, and uh, uh, $4.3 million in revenue. Uh, and so, yes, we actually 
uh, we account in what we call high revenue firms. We are accounting both for the the net worth and the and the revenue. We set the threshold at five million, a bit above the the annual threshold um, uh, to be a little conservative, but it's uh, so it's slightly under inclusive. But the high revenue uh, subset of firms are ones that are fit within those financial thresholds. All right, thanks. And to to this point of the 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 firms with the high revenues. Do you get any sense of why there is more interlock with this population? Um, and why is there more of a time as well? Because you showed that 20 years ago, this wasn't such a problem. Right. I mean, I say, so I, the answer is I have, I have uh, suspicions. I don't have uh, kind of evidentiary proof on those questions. I think one thing that's going on is we're seeing increasing market concentration um, uh, in, in these industries. Um, I do think that sort of financing is likely to be a, a mechanism. Um, uh, I also think that you know the um, sort of grabbing the person who's the sort of hot person in this field. Uh, lots of companies want to do it. Uh, lots of people are happy to serve on multiple boards, right? Um, uh, and so, you know, I think as it's be, you know, as people sort of did this in an increasingly concentrated market, uh, and no one complained about it, um, right? It just became more and more common. And you wanted the you wanted the board members that were popular that everybody else had. Um, uh, that said, I, you know, our, our data doesn't allow us to kind of tell you that that's the answer. It's a it's a kind of prediction in my. And so maybe one way to get to part of the answer will be if indeed you were to study the private firms, right? Because the roles right. of the VCs might be quite big. So do you have any plan on doing that? Or? Uh, we have hopes of doing that. So there are, uh, in, in this industry, there's a, a sort of like the crunch base, uh, uh, the tech crunch uh, a database of, uh, of startups uh, is kind of a gold standard. We hope to get access to that and to try to get access to that information. The other thing I think we would like to try to do, at least for the venture capital subset, is to look for not just is this person on multiple boards, but what VC, if it's a VC, what VC firm are they from, uh, mm -hmm. and is somebody else from their VC firm on an overlapping uh, uh, company board as well. I think that's going to be easiest to do in the life sciences area because because um, we still need the sort of it's going to be harder to get evidence of who a real competitor is uh, in the in the privately traded firms outside of life sciences. The fact that the FDA requires you to go file your uh, new drug application and sort of point us to what you plan to do and in what particular space makes it mm -hmm. easier for us to get data here. There may be other industries, by the way, where, you, where there are similar sorts of data. So one of the things we're looking at is government contracting. Right, where again, there are similar disclosure requirements, we may be able to sort of find companies who are bidding in competition with each other for contracts, how often do they have overlapping directors. Uh, mm -hmm. But it'd be nice to get a sort of broader vision of the of, of all the markets. Uh, and there the problem is, you know, market definition uh, is a complex uh, phenomenon. How do we decide whether two companies are competing, right? Even mm -hmm. when we know the names of the companies, it's often hard to do that. Yeah, and you mentioned cr crunch base. Uh, it's not it's not a sustainable solution, but if you are interested in that, I think you can create an account again, a one week access, so you could play with it as well. Uh, yeah. We are short on time, but I want to ask two last questions. There is one in the chat by Maria. She's asking if you are also studying whether or not those companies are vertically integrated. So if there are more issues than just those of the interlocks. Interesting. So I have not studied that. I mean, I think the... Uh, I don't think the law currently prohibits it, um, uh, but um, uh, but I do um, you know I I do sort of I, I think it's an interesting question. I'm less worried about that, right? Honestly, right? Because some of those are uh, are, are are you know maybe uh, companies that actually have a sort of business relationship that's ongoing. Uh, but that still might be significant, right? Because maybe it affects whether or not I have an exclusive deal with this firm. Maybe it affects whether I'm actually willing to compete. So that would mm -hmm. be um, that would be interesting. Um, so I'm going to just put in the Q and A for anybody who wants it because I don't. I'm not sure I can put things in the. Well, maybe can I put things in the chat for everyone? Yeah, here we go. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, so here's the link to the paper, uh, yeah, so you can way. actually see the data itself. Uh, and I will note that as of today, we are going to release the raw data 
uh, including the names of the companies, the names of the boards of directors, et cetera. Um, and we're going to release it on the on the Codex uh, uh, GitHub site yeah. with, yeah. that's uh, run by the Computational Antitrust Center. Yeah, I'll put the link also in the chat. Okay, one last question. You mentioned the automation and the use of computational antitrust or the, the fostering of it. Uh, political question. Do you think it's politically, It's we know it's technically feasible, right? And we yesterday had a discussion with the Czech competition agency that are doing it already. But do you think it's politically feasible in the United States to, to implement this kind of solution? Right. Yeah, well, so, you know, I, I think anything that requires legislation might, by definition, not be politically feasible in the United States, regardless of subject matter, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, but but leaving that aside, um, I think there might be ways to try to at least start this rolling. So you could certainly create, the agencies could certainly create a voluntary database, right? Uh, you come participate and you can, you can sort of find out whether you've got a problem. Uh, I think the agencies might also say, as they're starting to enforce this, look, any company who we've caught having this problem in the past, well, now you've got to come register. Now you've got to come participate as part of a... Of a uh, uh, remedy for the for the previous antitrust uh, problem. Mm -hmm. So you know, while the easy and sometimes the kind of simplest thing to do would be pass a law that says create a registry. I think there may be ways for the agencies to sort of uh, get entrepreneurial here and to create uh, either a voluntary registry or a registry that at least sort of previous offenders are required to um, uh, are required to to deal with. All right. Well, uh, yeah, and that sort of, uh, are we tracking family members? We aren't. No, that's another interesting idea. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. So, the, I mean, we could see it already triggers a lot of interest and you could see how to expand the study. Uh, it's been fascinating. So thank you so very much for this study and also for your support over the years. Uh, it, it's been a long time. You've been helping me in, in, in so many different ways. So well, and we're, so and we at Stanford are, are happy to be involved with this and happy to have you doing it. So keep up with your work. All right. Thank you very much and see you very soon.